My name is Katherine Allen and I live and work in Midland, Texas and I paint landscapes. Uh, the works I have on view in the 10 Years 10 Artists exhibit are paintings of the kinds of places that people live here in Midland. Um, Man Camp is a description of uh, temporary housing that gets set up for the crews of workers who are employed in the oil field. And Yard Sale is a genre painting set in um, a familiar looking city neighborhood. Um, in both pictures, kind of the desert motif of land and sky anchor the composition and shine through uh, the infrastructure that we're so used to seeing kind of everywhere. So um, telephone poles, sidewalks, dumpsters, roads, things like that. Um, and I like these two paintings together because um, the contrast between the temporary encampment and the established neighborhood um, is kind of interesting to me. Um, always with that through line of the West Texas sky as it sort of hangs over kind of around and even gets into kind of everything. I do live and work here in Midland, Texas and the landscape here is very spare. So among those who move to Midland or visit for the first time, the common refrain is kind of like, there's nothing here. And for a long time, I really did agree. Um, but at a certain point in my life, I was fortunate enough to go to college locally, both at Midland College and at um, the University of Texas of the Permian Basin in Odessa. And I received my bachelor's degree in art. Uh, so for me, learning how to paint meant learning how to see the world and my life with new eyes. And it also gave me the work of other artists and the whole canon of art history with which to kind of refresh my vision when I need it. Um, so there's a photographer that I love named Robert Adams and he's been really helpful to me recently. He's a landscape photographer and an art educator. And in his photos and essays, he's constantly pointing to like the persistence of life as a sign of hope. And it's a kind of a hope that um, carries on in the face of existential crises, not unlike the environmental concerns that we face here that are specific to West Texas. But, you know, I should also point out um, that these kinds of concerns are not uncommon to communities everywhere right now. Um, so while we can and probably should speak about um, landscapes in a state of decline, uh, the fact that they remain, that they're still here for us and with us, um, really is a thing of beauty. So broadly speaking, I think the hope inherent in life and the grief of loss always go hand in hand. And for me, painting gives a window in, in which to kind of contain both of those things. So the works on view in this show, I think, are good examples of that. What is your creative process like from concept to completion? So my paintings are based in photography. Um, I take pictures all over town as I go about my day, and the photos that I take are not highly considered. I'm sort of fishing for elements that I can later um, cut and paste into digital collages. Um, because I was born and raised here in West Texas, I'm familiar enough with the landscape and my subject matter um, that bits and pieces of what I see in my photos can kind of guide me into what my final image kind of wants to be. And I'm done with a collage. It, it can be hard to know when I'm done working on a collage, but kind of one of the signs is that it will begin to fit together uh, formally to create a sense of depth and uh, without kind of hiding the jagged edges of the pieces of the collage elements that I use to put it together. Um, and the reason I don't cover those up is because it's kind of a way to be honest about my own involvement in the creation of the picture and the nature of the image itself. Um, so after I finish a digital collage, it's kind of straightforward painting stuff. I will uh, build a canvas, uh, draw the collage onto the canvas and paint it. And that kind of part of things, the painting allows me to slow down and consider the scene that I've put together. Um, I'm happy to show the digital sketches like I did in my show at the Wright Gallery kind of on their own, but I'm kind of biased, I'm a painter, and I always think everything is better as a painting. Um, 
And pain is such an interesting substance. It can take on the characteristics of really anything that you want to portray while still kind of remaining itself. Um, so I really like the insights that come with the challenge um, of working through an image in paint. What impact did your initial Wright Gallery exhibition on route in 2022 have on your work or career? Well, my initial show at the Wright Gallery, it was meaningful for obvious reasons. You know, not only is Texas A&M just a really well-respected school, the gallery itself is a stunning space in which to show work and the faculty and the students with which, with whom I got to interact during my show, um, they were authentic, they were kind, and they were interested. And that's just not a combination you get a lot of times. Um, so when the show was well received, it kind of confirmed a working theory I've had that um, the stuff of life really is the stuff of art. And while I don't know that I've yet made anything that could be considered art in like the highest sense. Um, I do know that I came away from that show with a lot of encouragement. Um, and, you know, I'm a person who desperately wants to make paintings. I always want them to be good. And so I think my takeaway has been that my first step in doing that is to take like the business of living very seriously with all that that entails. So like the dread of driving to work on Monday morning to the euphoria of seeing a beautiful sunset. You know, those experiences have equal weight when it comes to making paintings. I would say that my show at the Wright Gallery kind of hammered home the importance of um, following your life as a way of pursuing art. So, and I would just add too that in, pla in a place like Midland where people move primarily for work. Um, it's an idea that's especially important because if people think that moving to a remote place to work a job that will better themselves and their families is a totally artless experience, then art suffers. I think we really want to see the world as it presents itself to as many people as possible. And that's what all of my instructors at the colleges here understood about the area and the people. And um, so again, I wanna thank the Wright Gallery and the faculty at Texas A&M um, just for the opportunity to show the world that I see. Hi, my name is Jennifer Chenoweth and I'm a visual artist out of Austin, Texas. I was invited to uh, exhibit at the Wright Gallery in 2015. And that space was very, large and dynamic. It had great light and these big movable walls. And it was a really exciting honor to be invited, first of all. And then secondly, um, I had the opportunity to do all new work for that particular audience, for the architecture and the construction services and the visual arts and all of the different students who met in that building. Um, it's a really specific group who are thinking about place, which is something I care about a lot as well. So I had a really fun time kind of making a mock-up of all the walls and the size and how big I could make things and what the layout of the whole show, which all was all very planned. I did a series of really large drawings that were um, basically uh, plan views of historic buildings, uh, some of them basilicas, some of them Greek or Roman or later. And I was looking for floor plans of buildings that felt like they were a figure or a character, kind of like um, Basilica, of course, is a cross shape, but others were a little bit different. And um, making them into kind of uh, having this kind of large looming feeling, they were all a little bit bigger than a big person would be. I created a couple of sculpture, a big sculpture based on a model that I also showed that was of a basilica shape. And it was really fun at the opening to see people kind of viscerally interact with the pieces and get under them and near them and interact with them like they were the characters they meant to be. It was really exciting. Um, and through that project, I was also, I got to know a lot of the right uh, gallery panel members and faculty members. And they learned about a big public art placemaking project that I did. 
So um, that project was called the XYZ Atlas. And so collaboratively, we applied for some grant funding and I brought that project to Bryan and College Station after that, which was extremely satisfying and fun. So not only was that show particularly meaningful and incredibly satisfying as an artist, it developed into some very great professional relationships that helped develop my work. The drawing I did for the 10 years, um, 10 artist ex exhibit was uh, a lot more fanciful, fun, and playful than a, some of the work I have done previously. I knew this was going to be one piece for this show, and I also wanted it to be uh, an architectural plan view, but this one was really different. I revisited the house I remodeled and lived in and had an artist studio in for 19 years where I raised my family and had amazing art shows and exhibits and hosted other artists. Um, it was part of the East Austin studio tour for many, many years and was kind of a cultural hub for a lot of people once a year. Um, and due to life changes and the changes in Austin, we sold the house in 2018, but boy, do we miss it. Life has gone on and it's fine, but we all miss that house, and my children had really fond memories of growing up there. So this was kind of a dream-like, playful flyover view of the house, not meant to be super realistic, but kind of recalling the rooms, how unusual the stuff in them were, some of the memories, stuffed animals, dogs, <laughs> Weird big public art pieces that were installed in the yard or in the house or different things over time, which the casual viewer might not know what that thing is that I'm drawing, um, but we remember it fondly. So uh, I was hoping to share with the Texas A&M audience something that was just a little bit more whimsical um, and kind of recalling place and we all have memories of home that are just so specific and so meaningful. So this was an opportunity to revisit that for my family. But this drawing has an audience of two, my two sons that were born there, but of course, everybody else that visited. My name's uh, Tommy Fitzpatrick, and I live in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I'm a uh, working artist here in town. and and uh, have a show coming up in Los Angeles and in uh, Palo Alto in February. And I'm a, I run the painting department at Texas State University. Um, the piece in the show called Geomorphic um, comes from 2019 and was a pivotal uh, period in my um, painting life in that I had just recently switched from working from models uh, to using uh, CAD programming to develop my imagery. In addition to um, using the computer to generate imagery, I also began to use thicker surfaces and began to use uh, concrete trowels and other devices to um, build up the surface of my paintings. So how would you say that your work may have evolved um, since 2019 from your original solo exhibit called The Working Model? The main shift that happened, and I have to think it has something to do with the show um, there at the Wright Gallery, was uh, switching to um, the computer and using CAD programming to draw things as opposed to making physical models out of plexiglass or wood that I would paint. I shifted to a virtual kind of tool or draw drawing on the computer and um, you know, being there, the building and being around and going actually and visiting classes, potentially, I'm not totally, I mean, I've always wanted to use the computer in ways, but I think all of that had to kind of influence me and made me want to sort of push forward and try to work in a more virtual way. I got to meet a lot of really great people and become friends with um, different folks there at um, Texas A&M. I also think being like, as I mentioned before, but being in the architecture building and being around those students and meeting with the students at my show. And it made me think about the work uh, differently and that I've always worked with architecture, but to have a show in the right gallery, which is an architecture building, it all was very, uh, felt really uh, like I had a lot of um, synergy to it. That was very inspiring and, and kind of made me want to push further 
with my investigation of architecture. And the painting that's in the show at the Wright Gallery uh, entitled Geomorphic, there were a number of um, factors that went into the making of that piece. Um, one was the scale of it. Uh, the dimensions of the painting are based on one of my favorite paintings in Chicago, uh, Ed Hopper's Nighthawk. And the palette was actually uh, influenced by a Georgia O'Keeffe painting that I've always admired. So I was doing a little, I was appropriating things in different ways, uh, just be thinking about uh, like a formal appropriation. The drawing of the building itself was rendered in CAD and was inspired by a lot of the brutalist uh, mega structures of the 1970s. And, and most of those buildings are made out of concrete. Um, and, and a lot of those um, ideas about uh, texture and surface of those brutalist buildings kind of influenced the way I thought about the way to apply paint. So um, because it because it was um, inspired by brutalist architecture, um, I started to think about, wow, I could use paint in a way more like concrete, uh, stop using brushes and use um, concrete trowels and spatulas and things to apply the paint and let the paint really be itself and not try to smooth it out or to take away its identity and to allow it kind of find its own form. So um, that painting, along with a few others from 2019, were super important because I just started to sort of let the paint, I kind of sort of opened up the painting process and allowed for um, uh, it to kind of have its own voice. And so, and I'm, to this day, I'm still working that way where it's a kind of a constant um, uh, relationship between what I'm trying to get out of the paint and what it's doing to me. And um, it's, it's opened up my work in a lot of ways. And, and I really um, felt like it was necessary, one, because the CAD programming, something about the printout that I would use to derive the image from was sort of colder and more virtual and I felt like it needed the human touch. And so um, the kind of virtual information that's rendered is then uh, met with the, the kind of actual uh, hand gesture remarks from the paint itself. And I felt like those, the marriage of those two things was important to have the work be more singular so that although it references architecture, it's really about the painting and about the viewer's relationship with the surface and the way the lights hit the painting and create its own typography, its own surface with its own highlights and its own shadows. So it actually, the paintings in themselves become architectural in a way, almost like bas relief um, and kind of even further talk about structure and systems and architecture and things like that. My name is Brian Florentine. Uh, I am an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Arlington, where I'm also assistant department chair. And I am an artist who works with photography frequently, but also does installation art. Can you please describe your work featured in the 10 Years 10 Artists exhibit? That work is from the Prepared Shelves series which is really, it's composed of multiple sub-series and each of those sub-series is a sequence of four photographs, all of which refer at least obliquely to William Henry Fox Talbot's early 1840s photographs of objects on shelves. So which objects and materials I choose to place on the shelves and where I place them is very much an intuitive process. Uh, and it relies heavily on chance, partly because I'm taking advantage of materials that I have in the studio, often borrowing things from, from other uh, artworks. In fact, every photograph in each of these sequences involves chance occurrences, hence the title, Prepared Shelves, borrowed from John Cage's Prepared Piano Pieces, in which he placed a variety of objects and uh, materials inside a piano to produce unexpected and unpredictable sounds. In addition to chance intuitive processes, I also select some elements for these photographs that are based on shapes that repeat um, inside the photograph, but are materially different from each other and often radically so. So after photographing the shelves from two sides, I push the shelves over, allowing it to crash on a slight incline on the studio floor. Um, and then I photograph that result from overhead looking down. So 
the photographs really only show the top half of shelving that's actually six feet tall. So when weighed down with heavy objects, such as concrete, for example, and books and other materials, the collision with the incline creates significant force. It's also loud, very loud. Setting it in motion and then allowing gravity and the collision to rearrange the elements um, is introducing another element of chance. So then the use of chance extends to one last photograph in the sequence of four in which I completely remove the shelving and allow the contents to collapse further into chaos. And then the, the frames that I use for the series, uh, the frame color very closely matches the shelves within the photograph. And in that way, the frames function as uh, extensions of the imagery as well as containers for it. So that along with the one 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 to one print size, which means they're the same size in the print that they were in reality. Um, and then no glazing enhances the mimetic quality of the photographs. Uh, it's kind of a trompe l'oeil effect. And like much of my work, this series deals with the relationship between photographs as images, photographs as objects, and photography's relationship to the material world that photographs often mimic. I would say that my process is really a variety of processes. Sometimes an idea just pops into my head seemingly out of nowhere, which is not uncommon for artists. Uh, at other times, it's the result of carefully observing the world around me, thinking, making notes, revising those notes over time. And then I put whatever idea or concept I come up with into production, usually in the studio, which has been what my practice has been lately, studio-based. Um, that will also get likely revised again during the production phase. And often I would say new projects evolve from other projects in a kind of morphological process. So for example, the prepared shelves series came about after photographing books and periodicals densely packed onto wooden bookshelves in a reference to Talbot's A Scene in a Library. However, in my photographs, the books are shown from the page inside rather than the spine side. Uh, the shift to including many other objects along with books and prepared shelves uh, and other printed material happened organically, as did the shift from wooden bookshelves to metal shelving. And as the prepared shelf series progressed, I've made the photographs more fragmented and the materials and objects in them more disparate, partly in response to the increasingly fragmented quality of contemporary life, or at least that's what my sense of it is. Um, the photographs have always also become more chaotic, even while parts of them appear organized. And again, it's the way being in the world feels right now. Uh, what impact did your initial Wright Gallery exhibit have on your work? So that was something tangible in 2021. First, that exhibition was a significant factor in my successful third year review in the six year tenure process that I'm undergoing at UT Arlington. <clears throat> Years three and six require comprehensive reviews of research, which for most artists means exhibitions at significant venues such as A&M. Second, two photographs from that exhibition marked the start of a new body of work. The two photographs in the 10 years 10 artists exhibition, a part of that ongoing series, this, which is the prepared shelf series. These photographs and related ones have been selected by uh, widely respected jurors for many national group exhibitions in the past two and a half years since my previous solo exhibition at AM. A, a quick partial list uh, includes the University of West Georgia, Columbus State University, also in Georgia. Colorado, Colorado Photographic Arts Center in Denver, Strata Gallery in Santa Fe, Photographic Resource Center in Boston, and Access Gallery in Sacramento, along with uh, seven or eight others in that period. My name is Jen Hassan, and I am an artist from Austin, Texas. Um, I'm born and raised from Texas, and um, I'm an artist who works primarily in social practice, 
and I use paper making and the processes involved with paper making um, to uh, utilize community engagement um, and bring people together. Tell us about your work that's featured in the Wright Gallery. Uh, so the work that's featured in the Wright Gallery is from a project that I uh, wrapped up at the end of last year. Um, it was exhibited in New York City uh, and it's work that I made with a group of women from Afghanistan. Uh, this group of women served in the Afghan military, um, which is a very small elite group of women um, that was recruited and handpicked to serve in the Afghanistan military. Um, they were special forces uh, and um, their primary function um, in the Afghanistan military was to um, be uh, the uh, group of people that would interrogate the women of the Taliban. And so um, uh, when the fall of Afghanistan happened, uh, these women um, obviously needed to get out of Afghanistan. So in 2021, um, they became refugees in our country. And as a uh, veteran of our military. Um, naturally, uh, I found myself in this position uh, where um, I would be making artwork with them. So um, uh, the works that are in the right gallery are pieces that um, are made out of transformed American and Afghan military uniforms, um, as well as um, uh, hijabs that the women wore in Afghanistan, um, clothing that they wore on the planes, the C-130s coming to America. Um, uh, there's also um, a maroon that's on the piece with the two doves. Um, that's from a ceremonial dress um, from one of the women. Um, so there's this uh, really um, beautiful uh, and heartbreaking kind of story that goes along with these women that um, uh, that I, that my transformative process that goes along with my work really um, uh, was uh, powerful for me to uh, to bring to them, but also powerful for them to go through. So um, uh, it was uh, um, the project was called Project Raha um, and. Uh, uh, it um, it was one of the most incredible things I've gone through in my life. Um, so uh, y'all have a couple pieces to show from that. Can you tell us briefly about your initial exhibit at Wright Gallery? Sure. Um, the initial exhibit was in 2018. And um, that exhibit uh, had uh, military uniforms that had been transformed. So I should talk about the transformation real quick. Um, from uh, clothing to paper. Um, so in 2018, I um, wasn't making pulp paintings yet. I was uh, turning um, clothing into paper. And the pulp paintings are just this thing that I came up with um, in the meantime, but or since then. But uh, so um, to do that, uh, you take clothing and you cut it up into um, tiny little squares, like one inch by one inch squares, and then you put it into a machine called the Hollander Beater, um, which is just basically a blender for paper making, and um, that turns the material into a pulp. Um, and with that pulp, uh, we then mix it with more water and uh, put it through a screen, uh, which looks a lot like a window screen, but a little bit uh, finer of um, a weave. And then we press that down onto felts. Uh, and then when we lift it, it's a sheet of paper when it's dried. Um, and so uh, that is the process of um, paper making. It turns out into like a sheet of cotton rag paper, um, which uh, people in the art world are familiar with that term. Um, the print that's behind me here, the scorpion print, that's what that is. All the rolled paper, um, that is the cotton rag paper. Um, so uh, the paper that I make um, to get the materials to that I use, the clothing that I use, um, to turn into paper, it has to be at least 50% natural materials. So, um, so a lot of times I get clothing that's polyester. I have to make sure that I mix it with clothing that is at least 
50 or at least at, like uh, the equation has to be like half cotton or half natural materials. So um, anyhow, so that's that process. And so the, the exhibit that I had at Wright Gallery um, was um, really uh, a show, um, it was called Respect, and it was a show that um, was about respecting military service, respecting um, what it's like as a veteran, um, uh, as somebody who's gone through service to, um, to respect that that moment in time that you've gone through, but it's not about respecting somebody else's service as much as respecting like your own walk in life and that like you may not know what somebody else has gone through. Um, and so uh, in my artist talk that I gave at Wright Gallery, I talked about like being kind of a unicorn within the military service. Like it wasn't obvious whenever I got out that I was a veteran. But, and I'm still like that. I like still find myself in these veteran um, uh, communities where like I can speak that language. I can go and speak in acronyms and I completely fit in with the military and veteran world. Um, but then I also can go and I can fit into the art world and I can speak that language too. And, um, and it's, uh, like you can't judge a book by its cover and we we're all working our own like we're all walking and working in our own worlds and we have to respect one another and so in that show I also introduced um, making work with out of civilian clothing too and adding color um, which that was my first time to do that um, but I asked students at um, Texas A&M to write uh, what respect meant to them um, on paper and then we added it into a big installation that was in the center of the gallery um so this last question is what impact did your initial right gallery exhibit have on your work or career so um I will say for uh the the right gallery um for uh the thing that I walked away for my career um like I I made these pieces that um that were on the outside wall. There were um, pieces that were from each branch of the military. There were like, so one was made out of a Navy uniform and then an Air Force uniform, an Army uniform and a Marine Corps uniform. And um, they were each made out of uh, a single uniform to represent a single person that I had extreme respect for. Um, an individual that made a difference in my life I wouldn't be where I was already at in my career or in my life without that person. And, um, and I gifted those pieces to those individuals. And so it was like a way to acknowledge like where I was at at that time and where I was headed. And, um, and so uh, I will say like that show was like this moment to just acknowledge like here I am here's this next stage. I'm entering this next moment in my life. And like, and it was called respect, which I think was like a perfect name for it. Um, uh, just for not just the show, but just the moment and what it represented for me, because I think it was kind of this camouflage of like me trying to say respect to the military, which was like, not at all what I was trying to say. And like, I think Texas A&M was like kind of the perfect audience for that, especially the vis like the the students of that that they understood what I was trying to say. Like the students that came to the artist talk definitely were like, oh yeah, like I wasn't trying to say you need to respect the military. Like that's awesome if you do, but like just respect yourself, your own journey, and respect the fact that you don't know what everybody else is going through, and just be kind to everybody, and respect that you know, just lead with respect and you might get that respect back. So, yeah. This is Mayuko on a gray. I am located in South side of Houston. Tell us about your work featured in the 10 years, 10 artists exhibit. So I have two works included in the exhibition. One is a large cat drawing that you can't miss when you walk into the gallery space. 
And this other one is a small piece, which is kind of a close to the drawing. So both of the drawings are very typical of my work. So my works are usually a combination of images, which I usually take my own photographs from, and I combine that with a Japanese proverb, which I find um, interesting to go with the image. So um, the line you see is actually Japanese writing, starting from top right to bottom left, following the Asian writing. And after I write the proverb out word by word, then I start connecting them. It's kind of like a fun puzzle to one strand in the end with one entrance on the top right and the line continues on and ends on the bottom left. So for me, it is a metaphor almost of life, how you are born and you get your body, this physical existence, and you live through your life. And then you take the exit or you lose your body. And where do you go? Like I am always uh, yeah, fascinated or I'm interested in like why we are here if we're gonna die like and what we are supposed to be doing here so the large drawing uh that is my cat the moxie so it was just a beautiful light coming in from the window uh he was sitting on my makeup table in the bedroom which is upstairs and he was looking at the bars on neighbor's roof. And I just thought it was beautiful to begin with, and it's ironic. So the Japanese proverb I used for the image is um, kawaii ko ni wa tabi o sasero, which translates to let your precious child explore. So the proverb means you love your child, you want to keep him or her safe at home, but if you really love them, you let them explore. So Maxi was a feral cat uh, who used to come around in the backyard, and we didn't want him to make our cat sick. So we took him to a vet, to get him treated for fleas and get the shots he needed and um, get him a fix. And he got one of the ear tip cut off. So if animal control catches him, he would be let to go because he's all good. So, so here Moxie is backwards. This um, fear of cat, is now house cat, like he would not go anywhere. So I saw there's a backwards of this um, proverb that he could go out and hunt the bird, but he just sits on the makeup table, just staring at them. And he doesn't have to you know, hunt for them anymore because we feed him well. So I, I just thought it was funny. So I used the proverb. Small work, is a photograph of my other cat, a squid. I know which is a strange name, but he is a 17 year old senior cat. And recently he became blind and almost deaf. And he pretty much sleeps um, all the time. So I started taking photograph of him when he's sleeping in his cat bed in my studio, because he makes this beautiful circle, which is almost like mandala. So that's one of the images I used. So 
So the Japanese proverb I used for the work is shiranu ga tana. In English, blissful ignorance. Because, um, so we are worried about when he's going to die, is he suffering? But he just sleeps there, just peacefully creating this beautiful circle. So it's actually a um, series. So I take his photograph almost every day. So I want to create uh, many different works in the series. And in original Japanese proverb, it actually says, not knowing is the flower. I just didn't know how to translate that. So I just say blissful ignorance. But so he's like flower that doesn't explain. It just leaves and when it's time to, you know, go, it goes peacefully. And it's like how he's my cat is. And it, it just, I mean, I love cats. And they, they are like, um, what Eckhart Tolle, one of my authors I like, uh, he famously said that he had lived with many Zen monks or Zen masters, all of them cats. And I totally agree him with him. What impact did your initial Wright Gallery exhibition, A Picture is Worth a Thousand Words in 2021, have on your work and or your career? Right before this exhibition I had at the Wright Gallery, I had an um, emergency um, medical condition and I had to get the abdominal surgery. So I could not install the show in person. So I had to ask an artist who also handles artworks installations. Uh, his name is Marcos Hernandez. He's an amazing artist. So when I got to see the work, I mean, when I got to see the exhibition, it's like walking into the space and seeing all of my babies all together in one space and it just was amazing um experience to see all the large works together because my studio is not the large so i can only have one drawing at a time so seeing that um the, my large works are harmonizing with each other especially i love the two self-portraits almost facing to each other really look good together so the exhibition i had at the right gallery gave me a validation or encouragement or confidence of keep drawing large if that's what i want to do and yeah that was the biggest thing for me uh, looking forward, what are your artistic aspirations or plans for the future? A few ideas I am working on right now. So one, it's a Cat the Moon series, which I explained. Um, so I take photographs of my senior cat who sleeps almost all the time. And he creates this beautiful circle shape. Uh, like a mandala. And so I use that image in square format and creating that with a Japanese proverb, which says shiranu ga hana, which is in English, blissful ignorance. So yeah, I will be creating many of the Catamoon series with squeeze in it. And also, I make one self-portrait a year. It is for keeping record of my own physical decay, how I get the more wrinkles or age spots. So right now, I am working on self-portrait in the back, um, which I used bubble wrap. 
So sometimes I do my own photo shoot. So I was wrapping bubble wraps, which symbolizes that you want to keep that the physical object safe. But you know, even you try to protect yourself as much as you want to, but you still you're gonna die. You your your physical body is not permanent. It's not the forever. So I am playing with that right now. And the, um, so ideas come to me time to time, and I really, I don't and I can't plan ahead of what I'm gonna do. It's like once I start making art, then it leads to the next, like I get these messages or ideas I get from actively making art. So yeah, I, I'm also always looking for what I wanna draw next. My name is Ann Johnson, also known as Soul Sister in the art world. I am an associate professor of the practice in art at Prairie View a and University, and I'm also a practicing visual artist uh, based out of Houston, Texas, and my process of late, well, my process is technically experimental printmaking. Can you briefly tell us about your initial uh, exhibition titled She Matters in 2019? Sure. Um, she Matters initially started at Art League Houston. Um, the uh, initial uh, exhibition was 2017, 2018, and it was uh, post Sandra Bland tragedy in Walter County. And I got a group of artists together who may have been struggling with, uh, we see these people dying, unarmed people dying, but we don't hear about the women as often as we do the men. A lost life is a lost life. But I wanted to make space, even cry through the artwork. Um, for women. And I noticed that other artists were having a similar um, difficulty in trying to express those feelings. So I got the artists together and we created this exhibition called She Matters. And then um, we were fortunate enough to bring it to the Wright Gallery, which was a totally different audience than urban-based Houston. And so we were able to expose uh, the Texas a and community to the exhibition. And um, I, I would think that viewers that saw that exhibition handled the summer of 2020 a little bit differently because they should have seen those events differently based on what was um, expressed in that exhibition. So it ranged from printmaking to video um, installation. So it was basically artists expressing their emotions of sadness and grief and frustration with so many loss of women of colors and their lives. What impact did the initial Wright Gallery exhibit have on your own work and or career? Um, I have kind of been seen as an activist, you know, and in my own right, someone told me years ago to use your creativity as your activism. Um, the great thing about that exhibition is it did receive a, an award from the College Art Association. And um, so that meant more eyes were on the work, the artists, and the subject. And so I like to say I'm a retiring curator. I know you understand. <laughs> and, um, but um, it had more impact than I realized because I didn't realize so many people had seen it. And, um, and oddly enough, when I left that night of the opening and went to the, um, went to the Southern Graphics uh, Conference in Dallas, which is a printmaking conference, uh, from that conference was when I was inspired to print on cotton. And, and so you have one of those pieces in this show. Yeah. Right. Can you tell us more about the, the work that's on view at Wright Gallery currently? Sure. The uh, pieces that are on view are a little bit old and a little bit of new. Uh, as I said, I'm an experimental printmaker, so I print on anything except paper. And one of the first objects that I printed on was a feather. And um, when I printed on feathers, it was to honor my indigenous great-grandmother, um, who was at that time known as what we call a black Indian and uh, my African, African-American and ind indigenous ancestry. My parents are actually on a feather as well. So what I created is a prayer fan. I grew up in Wyoming, so I was always attracted to powwows and I loved how the women would dance and flow and they would always have a prayer fan. So I created a remix of the prayer fan. And then the other piece um, is a, um, 
three plate intaglio print on bonded cotton and it's called seeded and it's actually an image of myself and a number of cowrie shells and cowrie shells i have cowrie shells on now um, were used as currency at a time in africa but they're also a symbol of pride in jewelry and um, the image herself is a very defiant looking uh, um, domestic image, if you will, who just wants to be seen, right, for who she is. And so all of that story is in that little box. Yeah. What do you have currently planned or maybe what you're working on for the future? Sure. Uh, 2023 was a big year for me. I was just so busy. I had four residencies in a row, two solo exhibitions. <laughs> One in Houston, one in Kansas City that is still up at the Kansas City Art Institute. So I'm downloading a little bit, um, but I do have an exhibition coming up in Colorado Springs at Anderson Ranch with Deborah Willis, who was like one of my idols. So that's so cool. And um, I'm doing, I've am doing. i been doing work with uh, the Contemporary Arts Museum Houston and Freedman's Town in Houston. And I've been doing these new prints made from bricks. I'm making my own bricks because I'm so extra. And uh, and I'll, I'll be doing a couple of residencies in the summer. So I'm starting to load up as January. I'm in a couple of local exhibitions. And um, so my plate is already full. Great, thank you so much. Hi, my name is Brian Piana from Houston, Texas. And I'm an artist and a painter and a sculptor and a little bit of everything. Can you please tell us about your work currently featured in the Wright Gallery? I have two paintings, Obama's Last Night in Office and um, Biden's First Day in Office. And they're uh, reminiscent of what's over my shoulder here, but they're created actually through a, a feed that's generated by Twitter. And so just as a quick explanation, I created an algorithm that searches Twitter's public timeline for references to the, the words red, green, blue, and yellow. And then it creates, uh, in real time, it creates a pattern uh, of those instances. So, you know, we'll have stripes of color, as you can see here, or at the gallery, sorry. Um, and when that, when, uh, for instance, if there's two blues in a row, it seems like a wider bar uh, or two greens, it looks gets wider and whatnot. And so I would just watch the stream and take screenshots, and then those would become kind of paintings of just that geometric abstraction. But what I then started to do is uh, take a screenshot, and, and the two paintings that are in the gallery, uh, one was taken on. President Obama's last day in office. And then the other screenshot was taken on President Biden's first day in office. And then I started to play with them a little more formally. I introduced uh, some perspective lines and kind of pushed and pulled with some of the, uh, the bars to kind of invoke a three-dimensional space. And you can see in works like the one over my shoulder, rather than just keep them as a flat painting, I would introduce sometimes uh, other structures inside of the geometric abstraction. And so, these two paintings in the right gallery were the first that I've kind of pushed that sense of perspective in. And thematically, they tie in very well because uh, they kind of bookend uh, the Trump presidency uh, the night before and then the night after. How would you say that your work has um, evolved since your initial show, Blocks, in 2017 at Great Gallery? Yeah, that was really exciting. Um, I am an alumnus of Texas A&M, and so I spent a lot of time in the College of Architecture or the School of Architecture in Langford. And having the opportunity to show there was, was uh, a highlight of my career for sure. But what it allowed me to do was really work much, much, much larger. Several of the pieces that were in the block show were like vinyl, basically vinyl stickers onto the walls and the structure that existed in the gallery. So I created a, a mural that very much looked like their RGB and Y stripes uh, down the full length of a wall. And I wrapped another column, so a, a structural column that was in the gallery space, I wrapped it and made it into its own piece. And so that's kind of what, what I've taken from that, is I, I'm looking for opportunities to work at a larger scale as opposed to smaller paintings. I, I like the idea of pushing the physical size of the works themselves. How does your experience as an alumnus affect your thoughts about showing at Texas A&M? Great question. And like I said, uh, for me, this was a, a pinnacle moment, uh, being invited back to Texas A&M, uh, you know, I was there, I'm a graduate of class of 97, and then I was graduate from the Fizz in 2000. And so it was really a mountaintop moment for me, uh, very special for me. And I, I, I poured a lot into the show and I'm super proud of it. Um, I, as, a, as an instructor myself, as a teacher, 
I have lots of students that are interested in viz or viz adjacent careers, and I always am quick to point them back towards Texas A&M. Uh, you know, some people don't think that this this college, uh, kind of, you know, two hours away from Houston, is such an amazing resource for that kind of work, and it certainly is. And so, having the opportunity to show was phenomenal. Uh, being invited back to show these two pieces here was uh, also very special. And uh, as an alumnus, again, it, it certainly means a lot. Hi, I'm Lisa Woods. I am a media artist. I live in Austin, Texas, and um, I'm interested in themes of ecology. Um, I've an, an, an interactivity and participation. So most recently, I'm working with like themes of ecology. In the past, though, I've done uh, interactive works that um, also draw ideas of participating and interacting with the artwork. Can you please tell us about your work in the 10 Years 10 Artists exhibit? Yes. So my two pieces that are in the exhibit are both called Drawdown. I think it's Drawdown 1 and Drawdown 2. Um, and they were inspired by curiosity. So I have been, I've done a couple of series now about kind of technological interventions in our landscape that are on one level beneficial, but also kind of are problematic. And so um, I did an entire ex uh, exhibit about pollination. And then for this, um, these two pieces are part of a larger body of work that have to do with center pivot irrigation. And so looking at um, how we use irrigation specifically in the Great Plains, which are kind of like Texas, and let's see, uh, the state's kind of above us. Let's see if I can get my geography, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Kansas, all the way up to Kansas. So we have this big aquifer that I had no idea existed. And that's what I love about my work is often I can research things that are curious to me and then learn about stuff. And um, yeah, so my interest in like these interventions, especially around irrigation and agriculture, um, taught me that we have a massive aquifer in the center of the country. And since the 1940s, we've been using, relying on that quite heavily for our, our agriculture. So if you ever fly over the States in a plane and you see all those beautiful circles that transform the landscape, that is the water we're drawing from this large aquifer. And the wonder of that is that it produces 30% of our food. The issue with that is that that water is called fossil water. So just like fossil fuels, they don't replenish. And so um, the more we use that water, the more of a concern it becomes because we it, it just is, is a limited resource. And so I was really interested in that. So the pieces are about uh, really looking at that landscape, which we might be familiar at from flying over the country, because that's really the only way you see it. So I took satellite navigation photos or satellite photos and then um, considered how to do an intervention with them that was interesting, that showed that it's just the surface of the information that you have. And what's more interesting is really what's below, below ground. What impact did your initial Wright Gallery exhibition titled Gathering and Embodied Narratives in 2018 have on your work and or your career? Ah, showing Gathering in 2018 at the Wright Gallery was a fantastic opportunity to take a piece. This was an interactive piece, so one that had participation. So um, if you are not familiar with the piece, it was an immersive uh, environment that had to ask people to tell them a story. So in this case, the prompt was, um, what would you, let's see what the prompt was, if I can recall. What would you like Texas to be? I think was around that question. And I knew, I didn't know much about uh, A&M and um, kind of the, the student body or the faculty. And so it's a really, it was really interesting to see all the variety of responses. So the way people responded is they photographed their hand and they quote unquote wrote on their hand via an iPad. And then those images are projected in a larger kind of bowl, if you will, that you could walk into. And so um, it got a lot of really interesting stories. People can be creative, they could be controversial, they could reveal something about themselves or not. Um, it was kind of a very open prompt. And exhibiting it at a and I think, ta taught me a bit about the population there because there were answers that maybe if I would have exhibited in Austin or San Francisco or somewhere else, like who's interacting with the piece changes, obviously. And there's communities that are reflected back to the community via the work. And so it was just a lovely opportunity to see. And there were hundreds of uh, app, like uh, submissions. I think we had like over 300. So that was great that people enjoyed coming back. And they might have come back more than once. I don't know, because uh, all I saw was hands. Lastly, looking forward, what are your artistic aspirations or plans for the future? I This idea of the center pivot is kind of 
front and center in my mind. So there's many different ways to explore that. These were few pieces. Usually I work much larger, I work with interactive work. And so this was, this is an, an opportunity to take this concept and express it in many different ways um, to see kind of what resonates with people about this, this story and this concern that I have with this environmental issue. Um, so I'm just looking forward to exploring that a bit further. Uh, also in the, in 2024, the second part of the year, I'll be in uh, the UK, I'll be in London for half the year. And so just the very interesting, just, you know, experience of being abroad. My partner will be there. He's in academia. And so I'll have an opportunity to connect with folks in the UK for six months. 